So, hello everyone. Uh, today's stellar seminar will be given by Devo Giotti Kansabanik, who's uh, a PhD, a final year PhD scholar at the National Center for Radio Astrophysics of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Pune, India. Um, Devo Giotti joined uh, NCRA in 2017 as an integrated master's PhD student after completing his uh, bachelor's from the University of, of Calcutta in physics. And uh, uh, today he will be talking to us about remote measurements of plasma parameters of coronal mass ejections using spectropolarimetric radio imaging. So take it away. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Kevin for the nice introduction. So today uh, I will be talking about the remote measurements of plasma parameters of coronal mass ejections and you all know that coronal mass ejection is one of the crucial uh, uh, phenomena which determines the space weather around the Earth. And the, the electromagnetic, in the electromagnetic spectrum, the particular regime which I will be mainly focusing today is the radio wavelength and particularly at the low frequency or the meter wavelength regime. And the instrument I uh, I'm using for this uh, work is called the Murchison Whitefield Array, which is an uh, the square kilometer array precursor instrument in the Western Australia. So let's start uh, with what is the coronal mass ejection. So coronal mass ejections are large scale eruptions of magnetized plasma from the sun into the heliosphere. And Average velocity of these large eruptions varies from few hundreds to few thousands of kilometers per second. And mostly they are observed using the uh, coronographs uh, in the white light observations. And one of such uh, uh, movie you can see of the two coronal mass ejections are erupted and observed using the LASCO uh, C2 coronograph in this uh, movie. And uh, depending on the velocity, CME is need few hours up to few tens of hours to few days to reach the earth. Now, during this propagation, CME uh, may have the several deformations and also their propagation direction can change. So it also needs to understand how these deformations happen. And also it is important to understand how uh, the uh, coron from the coronal heights to the heliosphere and in the near earth space, how the CME evolves to understand and predict very accurately uh, the space weather in the near Earth region. Now, routinely CMEs are observed using Thomson scattered white light observations using coronographs and the heliospheric imagers. And we have several instruments in the space, uh, in, uh, some, some of them at the L1 point continuously observing at the sun. And uh, some of uh, also we have some ground-based instruments to observe the uh, some ground-based coronographs to observe the coronal mass ejections. Now, uh, the question arises that how do CMEs affect the art or whether all the CMEs that come to the art, whether they all can affect the, uh, the modern -day technologies or the, uh, in the art. The question is no, because the, it depends on the magnetic field strength and the magnetic field geometry of the CME when it arrives at the earth. So in this figure, what you can see that the CME is propagating in the heliosphere. And when the CME arrived at the close to the earth, it start, the magnetic field of the CME starts to interact with the magnetosphere of the earth. Now, if the magnetic field configuration is such that the magnetic field of the CME and the magnetic field of the earth becomes of opposite polarity. Then the magnetic reconnection can happen that will open up the magnetic field of the magnetosphere of the earth. And then the energetic particles can enter the earth's atmosphere, which can affect the uh, modern day technologies. So magnetic field strength and both that and the both the strength and the direction actually determines the geo effectiveness of the CME. And CM, as I told earlier, that CME evolves a lot during its propagation from the solar uh, corona to the heliosphere, to the uh, inner heliosphere, to the outer heliosphere. And 
Hence, it is important to track and measure the magnetic field of the coronal uh, mass ejections from the coronal heights to the heliospheric distances are essential to have a very accurate prediction of the uh, any upcoming CMS magnetic field and it's actually the vector magnetic fields of those CMS that to determine the geoeffectiveness of that CME. Now, uh, measuring the CME magnetic field is not very straightforward because the routine observations are done in the white light uh, uh, coronagraph images. And this cannot provide any direct measurements of the magnetic fields inside the CME plasma. But people have used uh, some techniques called the flux rope from the eruption data in the lower coronal heights using the UV observations that measure the reconnected flux rope and then use the geometrical modeling uh, using the white light observation, which can provide some indirect estimation of the magnetic fields in the CME plasma. But uh, there are some, uh, but this indirect estimation uh, not always correct and also uh, cannot provide any local variation of the magnetic field always. And also lot, depends lots on the geometrical modeling and all and how the how many space cap or multiple vantage points observations you have and depend and also what kind of uh, CME model you are using. Depending on all of this factor, the estimation of the magnetic field of the CME depends on the white light observation. But uh, in this case, uh, the radio observations can provide uh, are very well suited because they can provide remote measurements of the CME magnetic field, uh, both in the CME shock fronts because and also in the CME plasma itself. Now, uh, in the radio wavelengths, uh, we can use different. Uh, observables to uh, at the radio lens to uh, under measure the magnetic field of the coronal mass ejections. So I divide this with different observables or methods into two parts. One is the direct and indirect methods. So among the direct methods, we can people have used different kinds of radio bursts. So these radio bursts are the coherent emission from the either from the plasma emissions or from the a gyrosynchrotron emission uh, 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 from the coherent plasma emissions. And these are mostly from the CME shock spont and CME core. And CME shocks, uh, the plasma emission from the CME shocks are uh, associated with the uh, popularly known type 2 radio bursts. And there is another kind of incoherent radio emission that can also be used to measure the magnetic field of the coronal mass ejections. And this methods are including the circular polarization measurements of the thermal emission and the gyrosynchrotron emission from the non, uh, mild, mild, mildly relativistic electrons trapped in the CME plasma. Now the thermal emission is uh, intrinsically unpolarized, but in the presence of the magnetic field, the this unpolarized thermal emission can, indu can, can uh, introduce some amount of uh, magnet um, circular polarization. And if one can measure that circular polarization, they can estimate the magnetic field of the CME plasma. Now, there are two indirect and so using this method uh, from the ground based observations, one can measure the magnetic field strengths of the CME plasma up to around 10 solar radii. Because beyond that, uh, the magnetic field of the CAB and also the electron density becomes too low so that uh, the spectral optimal sp uh, observing frequency goes below the iodospheric cutoff that is about 10 megahertz and also the emission becomes too faint to detect with the current generation instruments. Now beyond the 10 solar radii we can use some indirect observing methods to measure the magnetic field of the CABs. A magnetic field and also some other properties of the CMEs. So this include the interplanetary scintillation, which have been used over a long time uh, to measure the uh, CAB velocities, CME electron uh, density fluctuations, and so on. And the another, the most important method is called the Faraday rotation method measurements of background linearly polarized uh, radio sources. 
and this spider rotation measurements can be used to measure the magnetic field strength of magnetic field of the coronal mass ejection in the heliospheric domain also now what kind of background uh, sources we can use for this purpose we can use either the galactic or extra galactic radio sources and also we can use the linearly polarized galactic diffuse emission so th the importance of this galactic diffuse emission uh, is that it is omnipresence in the sky and this uh, polarization flux polarized flux density is sufficiently uh, high compared to other galactic and extra galactic radio sources so using this diffuse galactic emission one can actually measure the magnetic field of a cme ubiquitously so in this talk i will be mainly focused among all these different methods i will be mainly focusing on these two methods so first is the gyrosynchrotron emission to measure the magnetic field strength of the coronal mass ejections up to 10 solar radii and then i will touch upon what uh, some progress we have made in the heliospheric fire rotation measurements using the background radio sources so let first start with the gyrosynchrotron emission from the cme plasma and how we can use that to measure the cme entrained plasma uh, magnetic field so what is this gyrosynchrotron emission? So gyrosynchrotron emissions are produced by the mildly relativistic electrons gyrating in the magnetic field. Now they are produced by the mildly relativistic either thermal or non-thermal electrons and with the Lorentz factor is about one to five. And these mildly relativistic electrons, the source of this mildly relativistic electrons can be from the, uh, from the uh, nearby active regions or can be from due to the shock acceleration or it may be produced by the local magnetic reconnection inside the CME plasma itself. And when this mildly relativistic electrons directing in the magnetic field of the coronal mass ejections, they produce this gyrosynchrotron emission. And hence, we can, if we can detect this gyrosynchrotron emission, it actually provides us the information of that magnetic field strain of that plasma a CAB plasma and not only that it can also provide and also some information about the part the uh, mildly relativistic electrons that producing this uh, gyrosynchrotron emission so uh, now uh, although it is known uh, over several decades the first uh, detection of this gyrosynchrotron emission from a coronal mass ejection was done by Bastian at all 2001. So in this image, you can see uh, the radio emission from a coronal mass ejections in, in this part and the corresponding spectra for these three, dif uh, four different regions are shown in this figure. So due to their spectral cover, uh, uh, port spectral coverage, they uh, only have three or two spectral points in the spectra. So uh, in this case, they have detected this emission up to 2.8 solar radii. And due to the small number of spectral points, they have assumed several, they have made several assumptions to model this observed spectra using the gyrosynchrotron model and estimated some plasma parameters, including the magnetic field of this uh, of the CME plasma in these regions. But after this first discovery in 2001, there are only a very handful of studies which actually managed to detect this gyrosynchrotron emission from the coronal mass ejections. So in this figure, uh, I have shown the spectra, some sample spectra from all of these previous studies. And you can see that some of them are at high flux density and also at the higher frequency. So these observations are done much closer to the sun, uh, when the CM is much closer to the sun. So the magnetic field strain and electron density are much higher. And for other observations, the the uh, are done mostly away from the sun and the flux density and the magnetic field strains are slightly sm uh, is smaller so the flux density is also small now most of these studies actually detected uh, the gyrosynchrotron emission from most of the first cmes only a handful of studies uh, except this mondol at all and in this uh, the work, uh, the example i am presenting in this work are uh, detected the gyrosynchrotron emission from the flow CMEs. 
Now, and another limitation of these observations, earlier observations were that this uh, studies, a number of these studies that have only the non-imaging observations. So they could not provide any special information about the plasma parameters they have estimated. So uh, initially it was th uh, thought that uh, only the gyrosynchrotron emissions uh, from the CAV plasma can only be detected from the first CMEs because the first CMEs are good ac particle accelerators. So it will produce a large number of mildly deterministic particles. So it is uh, easy to detect uh, the gyrosynchrotron emission for the first CMEs. But uh, with the observe uh, first studies by Mondo et al. 2020 by the MWA found that it is also possible to detect the uh, gyrosynchrotron emission from the slow CMEs as well. Now, why this, uh, there is such limitations in detecting the gyrosynchrotron emission from the coronal mass ejections, particularly the slow CMEs? The reason is uh, coming from the sun itself, because at the radio wavelengths, you one cannot use a coronographs to block any bright emission. One need a high dynamic range imaging to detect both the very bright and very faint emissions together. Now, in this figure, what I have shown, uh, this red bar shows the brightness temperature of different kinds of solar radio emission above at meter wavelengths. And the coherent radio emissions from different kinds of radio bursts are few orders of magnitude higher brightness, have few orders of magnitude higher brightness temperature compared to the quiet sun and also compared to the uh, gyrosynchrotron emission from the coronal mass ejection. Now, if we want to detect this coronal mass ejection, the gyrosynchrotron emission from this CME, one has to detect both uh, this faint emission in the presence of this very bright emission. And very often it has been found that uh, there is some kind of active emissions for either the type 2, type 4 radio burst or type 1 radio, uh, type 1 noise storms are present when a CME is erupting from the sun. So for that reason, we need a high fidelity and high dynamic range spectropolarimetric imaging. And since also these uh, uh, emissions also shows high temporal variations, one need a snapshot imaging capability. Now, this can be achieved using a, a radio interferometric array uh, in the Western Australia desert that is called the Murchison White Field Array. Since the radio interferometric imaging is a Fourier synthesis imaging technique, one needs to sample the Fourier space very densely to have a very high fidelity image. And that can only be done if you have the large number of antenna tiles, uh, antennas in your radio interferometric array. So MW has this capability. It has about 128 antenna tiles. And now currently it has increased to about 144 and distributed over a five kilometer of region. So it provides uh, this dense array coverage uh, provide uh, very high fidelity imaging of the uh, high fidelity imaging of the uh, sun per spectral channel and per spect uh, temporal uh, integration. But uh, although the data from the MWA is uh, capable of pro uh, providing this high fidelity imaging, one needs to also ca calibrate the instrument properly because uh, to have to have that final uh, high dynamic range imaging. For that, one needs to also characterize and model the instrument quite well, and also need to develop the calibration, uh, robust calibration uh, algorithm for the instrumental and ionospheric calibration. Now, this has been done using over the last sev past several years using uh, lots of uh, efforts. Uh, and the final outcome is the uh, spectropolarimetric polar calibration and imaging pipeline called the polarimetry using automated imaging routine for the compact arrays for the radio sun or PR cards. Now, this uh, pipeline we are using routinely for the MW solar observations, uh, analy analyzing the MW solar observations. And this pipeline now can produce the high fidelity spectropolarimetric snapshot imaging with a dynamic range varies between about 300 to 10 to the power 5. 
and in terms of the polarization calibration purity it is it provides uh, the polarization full strokes polarization images on per high quality astronomical observations just to give an uh, idea uh, about the polarization purity the residual leakage from the stokes i that is the total intensity to the stokes q that is one of the component of the linear polarization is about 1% and the residual uh, leakage from the Stokes I to Stokes U is about less than 0.1% in most of the case. And for the Stokes V, that is the circular polarization is also 0.1%. And these leakages uh, we can measure using the uh, high dynamic, because of the high dynamic range imaging, we uh, can also detect a large number of background uh, radio sources for uh, and whose polarization is already known. So these, those background sources are used to measure these leakages of the instrumental calibration uh, of the instrument after the calibration, residual leakage. So these pair cards now provide up as the uh, high fidelity imaging capability. Now, this allows us to detect the much fainter gyrosynchrotron emission. And I, I should say that this is the faintest gyrosynchrotron emission reported till day from the Two coronal mass ejection. So in this image, you can see the background image is the Lasco C2 and Lasco C3 base difference image. And this contour represents the radio emission at 80 megahertz. And we can see we have detected uh, extended emission in the northern part, which is overlaid or uh, just overlapping on the white light coronal uh, uh, white light CAB. And also we have detected another component of the extended emission in, in the southwestern part. And when we looked at the data carefully, we found that this emission is not coming from, there is a very faint CME, but this is not coming from the CME flux slope, but it actually coming from a region where the CME actually interacts with a pre-existing streamer. So, and not only that, we, in this case, we have also detected about this radio emissions from gyrosynchrotron emissions up to 8.3 solar radii. And uh, for the first time also, we have detected the circularly polarized emission from the southwestern CAB. And you can see this, uh, this color map is the circular polarization image, fraction image. And these uh, uh, contours represents the uh, Stokes I emission at a 96 megahertz. So that is why it is not exactly matching with the contours at the 80 megahertz. Now using this, both the Stokes I emission and the Stokes V emission we have detected from this uh, CMS, we can uh, use this information to uh, model the gyrosynchrotron emissions to estimate the plasma parameters. Now for in this particular, in this talk, I will be mostly focusing on the northern CME. And for this northern CME, although we have not detected any circular polarization, but the robust polarization calibration allowed us to put a very stringent upper limits on the circular polarization. And I will show later that even with this upper limit, stringent upper limits, we can uh, robustly constrain uh, the CME plasma parameters using the gyrosynchrotron model. Now, we, since we have the imaging observations, uh, we can extract, we can estimate the, uh, the CME plasma parameters in a specially resolved manner. So what we have done, we have uh, extract, we have put the point spread function size regions from uh, over this uh, CME and extracted the spectra for each of these points PSF size regions for both of the northern and the southern CME. Now the regions marked with this uh, red color have the sufficient number of spectral points in the spectrum. And in those cases, we could perform the spectral fitting to estimate the magnetic field. But in the green region, so we don't have the sufficient number of uh, spectral points. So you only have two or three spectral points. So in those cases, we uh, could not uh, perform the gyrosynchrotron modeling but at some uh, frequencies, we have detected the emission. Similarly, is similar is the case for the southwestern CME also, but this uh, particular, these three regions marked by the cyan colors are the regions where we have also detected the circular polarization at 96 megahertz. Now, uh, uh, 
before going into the Ayurvedic court on uh, modeling in details, I uh, want to point out uh, to the uh, difficulty in uh, modeling this gyrosynchrotron spectrum. So the exact expression of the gyrosynchrotron emission initially provided by the Amati Adol, uh, 1969 is very compute intensive. So we have not used that. So we use a uh, numerical gyrosynchrotron code developed by Fleischmann and Kuznetsov 2010. And this code uh, is capable of considering any kind of electron distribution. But uh, for our case, we consider uh, the simplistic non-thermal electron distribution, that is a single power law electron distribution given in this form, where this delta is the power law index and n is the total number of non-thermal electrons. And E min and E max is the minimum and the maximum energy cutoff. Now, even in this, uh, using this simple uh, electron distribution, the gyrosynchrotron model has about 10 free parameters. And each of these parameters affect the Stokes I and the Stokes V spectrum independently. So that I have shown in this figure, but I'm not going into details of this figure. But what this figure is telling us that it is not possible to uh, estimate all of these 10 parameters independently only using the Stokes I spectrum. So for that reason, we need to polarimetry to provide some independent constraint and to break the degeneracy between some of these parameters. And also just including the Stokes V that is circular polarization spectrum is not enough. We also need to constrain some of the geometrical parameters of the gyrosynchrotron model like the depth of the uh, gyrosynchrotron source from the white light uh, coronagraph observations. So we are we have actually chosen this uh, uh, observation particularly because these have the multi vantage point observations from the LASCO from the L1 point and also from the Studio A and Studio B. So what we did, we performed the GCS uh, that graduated cylindrical model, cylindrical shell model of using this multi vantage point observations on, from these three uh, in, uh, observatories. And then we perform a ray tracing through this uh, of each of these PSF site regions for this northern CAB and estimated the line of sight depth uh, of this uh, GCS model. Now, this actually provides the upper bounds of the line of sight depth of the gyrosynchrotron source because the gyrosynchrotron source may not be exactly similar of the similar depth of the uh, white light uh, source because it can, only the non thermal electrons can only be localized in some part of the uh, CME, which actually producing this gyrosynchrotron emission. But that source size cannot be larger than the geometrical line of sight depth. So, this, geomet this white light observation actually provides a stringent upper limits on the line of sight depth of the gyrosynchrotron source. Now, after having that geometrical uh, parameter estimation, we also estimated the thermal electron density from the white light observations. And after that, we perform a joint Stokes I and Stokes V modeling of the gyrosynchrotron spectra. So in this figure, I have shown three example uh, region, the spectra from three example region of the gyrosynchrotron spectra. And uh, you can see all of this spectra have a clear nice peak. And in this, because we are talking, I am uh, presenting the results from the northern CME. The, for the northern CME, we only have the upper limits on the Stokes V. We don't have any detection. And we have performed the gyrosynchrotron modeling and find that all of them fitted well with the gyrosynchrotron model. And uh, this uh, and the reduced sky square is also very close to one, which suffice that the fitting is quite good. Now, uh, to demonstrate that the importance of this joint fitting of the Stokes I and Stokes V spectra. So what I did, I we uh, only fit the model param gyrosynchrotron model parameters using the Stokes I and also the joint fitting using the Stokes I and V. And in this figure, what you can see is the posterior distribution of the uh, different gyrosynchrotron model parameters 
for the Stokes I only fit and the Stokes IV joint fitting. So you can see that when we have used the Stokes I and V both spectra, the constraints are much more tighter in all of the parameters. And in some cases, for example, the theta, theta is the line of sight angle with the magnetic field. And also for the magnetic field strength, the improvement in the estimated parameters is more about 30%. So this actually tells us and demonstrates the importance of including the circular polarization in estimating the uh, in estimating the plasma parameters using the Gaussian Cotton modeling. So uh, we have estimated the six plasma parameters, uh, six parameters of the Gaussian Cotton model, and in previous studies uh, using only the Stokes I uh, in observations and without any constraint from the multi vantage point observation, they could only Feed these three parameters that magnetic field strength area of that gyrosynchrotron emission source and the non thermal electron power law index. And all other parameters they kept fixed at some uh, ad hoc assumed value, values. But in this case, we can also fit some of the other free other parameters because of the availability of the circular polarization. And not only that, it's also improved our model estimated parameters uh, parameters value. So uh, ha having said that, so we now uh, can use this method uh, for routine observations of the CAB using the MWA like instruments and also probably the future SK low to measure the CME plasma parameters uh, like the magnetic field strain, non-thermal electron density, and so on, at the coronal heights up to 10 solar radii. Now, but after uh, the 10 solar radii, as I told, we cannot use this method. Uh, but in those regions in the heliospheric domain, we can use the Faraday rotation observation to measure the magnetic field, CME magnetic field uh, using some indirect using this indirect technique. Now, what is the uh, Faraday rotation? Faraday rotation is the rotation of the plane of polarization of a linearly polarized emission when it passes through a magnetized plasma. Now, we know that the coronal mass ejection is a magnetized plasma. So when that propagates uh, in front of a background linearly polarized source, the plane of linear polarization will rotate due to the magnetic field and the electron density of the CM. And this rotation is actually uh, can be written in terms of the rotation measure and the square of the observing wavelength. And rotation measure is the pro integral product of the electron density and the line of set magnetic field. So uh, since this uh, the Faraday rotation is proportional to the lambda square, that is the square of the wavelength. The longer wavelength observations are much more sensitive for the small change in the rotation measure. So as we move away from the uh, sun, since the magnetic field and both the electron density becomes lower, so the RF rotation measure uh, contribution by the CAB also becomes lower. So in those regions, if we want to detect this Faraday rotation signature of the background sources due to the CAB, we need to observe at the low frequencies, that is the longer wavelength. Now, this Faraday rotation observations can only provide the estimation of the rotation measure. But one need to distinguish between the contribution of the electron density and the magnetic field uh, in the rotation of the measured rotation measure to have the magnetic field strength. And that electron density we can actually measure from the white light observations from the different coronagraph observations and in, or some heliospheric images. After doing that, we can have the line of sight integrated magnetic field. But our ultimate goal is to measure the vector magnetic field of the coronal mass ejection. For that purpose, one need to use the defined CME flux slope models which have several free parameters. And if you have multiple line of sight measurements of this Faraday rotation using multiple uh, linearly polarized background sources, one can constrain this model, the flux loop parameters to estimate the vector magnetic field of the CME in the, both in the coronal regions and also in the heliosphere. 
now uh, this fact technique has been already used and several experiments have been done uh, in pre uh, previously in the coronal heights using the very large array or VLA at one to two gigahertz observing frequency. Now, as I told that the to estimate the magnetic field or magnetic field at the heliospheric height, one needs to observe at the low frequency. So these VLA observations can only uh, uh, estimate or detect the Faraday rotation due to the CMS up to 15 solar radii. Another limitation of the VLA is that it had a very small field of view. So at the same time, one cannot have the multiple line of sight measurement. So for example, in this figure, you can see that uh, there are multiple about seven sources present, uh, which are occulted by the coronal mass ejection. But each of these sources cannot uh, are independently observed in a cyclic fashion over the duration of the observing cycle but they cannot observe uh, in a simultaneous, uh, simultaneously in a single room. Now, to use this myth of really observation to uh, constrain the CME flux flow, one has to assume that the magnetic flux flow parameters have not evolved during this course of the observations. And that is, uh, but we all know that during this observations, uh, about few hours of observation, the CAB magnetic flux groups can evolve. So this is one of the limitations of the current small field of view observations using the VLA, which can be changed using the uh, wide field of view instruments like the uh, MWA and uh, the Meerkat. Now, the wide, uh, because, uh, so the wide field of view instruments now provide a large number of these background sources to measure the Faraday rotation over a large number of line of sight simultaneously. But at the same point, they have several challenges. Because uh, when uh, you are observing is using a large field of view instrument, it is very often that the sun is also inside the field of view. So one need to detect the background sources, which are very faint compared to the uh, sun for just to give an idea the sources can go up to 10 janski or 100 janski where the quiet sun flux density is about 10 to, more than 10 to the power 4 janski so for that purpose one need to detect this back to detect this background sources in the presence of the sun in the field of view one need high dynamic range imaging so in this figure i have shown one such example from the mw observation where the sun is present at the center of the field of view and all the background, these small white dots are the background uh, sources in the uh, sources detected in simultaneously with the sun. And to give an idea about the field of view of this instrument, the this uh, pink circle represents the Lasco Cito field of view, and this is the white circle represents the Lasco C3 field of view. And this cyan dotted line is the MWA field of view that is up to 80 solar radii. And in close to the sun, we can also use the high frequency observation uh, instruments like the Meerkat or SCAP, which have the field of view. Uh, Meerkat has the field of view shown by this red circle. And the uh, SCAP has a field of view of about 30 uh, solar radii shown by this green box. Now, uh, the, our, to measure this Faraday rotation using this white field of view instrument, the first challenge is to detect these sources in the presence of the sun. And the first uh, step has been successful. We have detected about more than 80 plus background sources in the total intensity image. We have not yet uh, uh, analyzed the polarization uh, sources, uh, polarization images. Now, the sources we have detected down to the flux density of 4.6 Jansky in the uh, same field of view at 80 megahertz. And only over a small bandwidth of 2.56 megahertz and over a two minute of integration. So we expect that with the larger bandwidth and the larger integration. And also currently the MW is going into a upgrade. So after the upgrade, the sensitivity will increase. So we can detect much fainter sources in the presence of the sun itself. 
Now, uh, this goes about the background sources. But as I told initially that we can also use the galactic diffuse emission to preserve the Faraday rotation. And the importance of this uh, galactic diffuse emissions is that they are present ubiquitously uh, on the sky. So we can use uh, measure the line of set magnetic field of a CAB ubiquitously. And these are comparatively higher uh, flux density, have higher linearly polarized flux density than other background sources. So we have also detected the galactic uh, uh, diffuse emission, which you can see in this figure uh, in the presence of the sun at the center. So this is also a Stokes uh, image, but we are also working towards the detection of the linearly polarized emission. But uh, the main so after the detection, we also have to tackle uh, different other challenges to ultimately measure the uh, heliospheric Faraday rotation. So first, uh, of, uh, the, one of the challenge is the precise measurements of the aerospheric Faraday rotation. So what you can see in this figure is the contribution of the Faraday rotation measure or the Faraday rotation due to the different components of the CMEs and uh, in the helios uh, solar wind and for See a co rotating interaction regions and also the ionosphere. Now, when we are away from the sun, the contribution from uh, the CME is close to the ionospheric variation. Hence, to distinguish between the contribution from the CME, one needs to calibrate or remove the ionospheric RM contribution very precisely to have the uh, proper estimation of the rotation measure due to the CMEs at these heights. And then only we can robustly measure the magnetic field strengths using this heliospheric Faraday rotation measurements at uh, the heliospheric heights. So as a summary up to this point, so we are in a good place for the routine detection of the radio CMEs, even from the circle, um, slow CMEs. And the polarimetric observations now make, polarimetric imaging observations actually makes this method of this gyroscene quadrant model in more robust. And the pair cards makes the MWS solar data analysis very easy. So even uh, without any detailed understanding of the uh, radio interferometric analysis, one can use this uh, algorithm to uh, uh, this software to use uh, analyze the MWS solar observations. And we uh, these pair cards now allowed us to uh, work to, towards the Heliospheric Faraday rotation measurements uh, to estimate the magnetic field in the heliospheric domain, which still remains a untouched area. And we have achieved uh, some success uh, towards that. And once done, the spectropolarimetric imaging observations with the MWA and obviously for the with the future SK low can provide the remote measurements of the CME entrained magnetic field using the gyrosynchrotron emission for up to 2 to 10 solar radii and using the Faraday rotation measurements up to the 80 solar DDA using the heliospheric FR measurements. But uh, what about the lower coronal heights? We can only use this low frequency observation beyond the two solar DDA and so So for the cor lower coronal heights, one need to go at the high frequency because at lower coronal heights, the magnetic field and the electron density of the CMEs are larger. So the gyrosynchrotron spectral peak shift towards the centimeter wavelength. So to observe, to use this gyrosynchrotron modeling to estimate the CME plasma parameters at lower coronal heights, one needs to use uh, the observations at the high frequencies. And these are possible with uh, these are possibly possible with the MIRCAT, which is a SK mid precursor observing at the 550 to about 1700 uh, 1, megahertz. Now, why this instrument is suitable is similar because it the reasons are similar to the FWA because its array configuration provides its uh, high uh, dynamic range and high fidelity spectroscopic imaging capability of its dense array coverage. And also the sensitivity of the mid-cat is quite good. So, and also the surface uh, density of the linearly polarized sources at these frequencies are uh, much larger. To, so they are well suited for the wild field, white field Faraday rotation experiments at the lower coronal heights. But the meerkat solar observations are not commissioned yet. So to achieve these goals, we have to first uh, start the solar observation with the meerkat. And 
we have started uh, some commission uh, engineering commissioning observations with the mercant in the past few years and i just want to give some basic example of those things uh, in this slide so uh, we have performed some solar observation during the sixth uh, perihelion passage of the parker solar probe in 2020 and in this observation we kept the sun at the second side lobe of the meerkat that is about 2.5 degree from the face center and in this figure you can see the image from that observation this background image is the sdo 135 megahertz image 131 angstrom image sorry and this re contours represents the meerkat image at one gigahertz and we can detect the uh, radio emission from the this active region and also we have detected lots of extended emission over the uh, this quiet sun region at the limb so this actually tells uh, motivates us to pursue the meerkat solar observation with the sun at the Test center uh, and to and use uh, do that with priority because even with the second side low we can detect this quiet sun emission quite well. So midcat it demonstrates that midcat has the capability of doing this kind of observation. So for uh, to do this thing uh, we have done some uh, commissioning solar observation with the midcat. Uh, uh, UHF band up at 542,087 uh, uh, megahertz in collaboration with the Mercat engineering team. And we did some test observation and very luckily that observation covers the, both the quiet sun and also a, a flare. So that actually allowed us to test uh, what is the optimal attenuation uh, one can one should use for the solar observations and this test was successful and we have identified the optimal attenuation to be used for the meerkat solar observation at the UHF band. So after that, we now are also uh, doing the similar kind of test observations at the L band. But at the same time, we now also developing the calibration strategies for the meerkat solar observation because the calibration strategies are not exactly similar for the astronomy. Solar observation is not exactly similar to the astronomical observation. So we hope that uh, very soon we will have some good interesting results from the meerkat as well. And obviously that will open the new space space to explore with both of these uh, square kilometer array precursor instruments. So with that, I end here and happy to do any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Devil Jyoti. This was a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, let's see, are there any questions to the speaker? Maybe. With a, with a lifted hand or something. Okay, well, I can start with a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So the study of, uh, the gyrosynchrotron uh, spectra, the those fittings that you made, how many how many runs of the GS code did you do to get these distributions? Yeah, so we use about uh, ten thousand MCMC runs with hundred workers. So it's about ten thousand into hundred of means about ten million yeah. of GS runs. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are the? I mean, there aren't. I don't see 10 million curves here, or is it just lower? Oh, sorry, I... what's the what's the shading of of purple that we see there? I mean... uh, right. So this uh, uh this all these uh, uh light shaded purple lines are the spectra for each of those MCMC uh, some sample of from this MCMC runs. So it shows the distribution uh, of the spectra. So. All, whether all of them can, uh, all of them are within the error bars or not. And this blue black line is the uh, spectra for the median of the distribution of each of these parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the second question is: is uh, is the the polarization air version of air cars? Is that 
open source? Is that freely available? Can it be used? Or do right. we have so, to yeah, so we have recently submitted the pair cards paper and it will be soon published. And so, and in that paper, we have uh, make that publicly available through Zenodo, through GitHub mainly. Yeah, okay. it is publicly available. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Please just speak up if you have any questions. Okay, so seems like everyone understood everything. Um, thank you very much. I mean, this has been uh, very interesting uh, work, uh, and uh, yeah, good luck. Good luck with your work in the future. Um, and uh, we'll we'll keep reading the papers. So thank you, and thanks everyone for attending the seminar. <laughs>